this is the the poster said the third, but actually, wait, is that right? Yeah, let's just say it's the third iteration of of this year's reading series, which is called Close Distances. Um, and there's a different co-curator for uh, each of the readings. And this month it's Sawako Nakiyasu, um, who I knew uh, as a writer and translator before we ever met. And I feel so honored to uh, have planned plan this together. Um, it's really, it makes me feel fancy. Um, <laughs> And um, what else? What else should I say? Um, I just also want to thank um, James Loop, who is the one of the the nodiest of nodes of Belladonna nodes <laughs> uh, in the whole choral field, um, and also also uh, Catherine Sanchez and Rebecca Ramdan, who I don't know if you're here in an official capacity, but I'm just thanking you anyway, because you always are doing Belladonna stuff and it is appreciated. Um, so I just wanted to honor that crowd first. Um, we've got three readers tonight and um, I think we're just gonna read their bios and then hear, hear from them. Uh, no, no fuss, no muss. We're just getting into it. Um, so I believe we are starting with Lindsay Choi, um, who is based in Berkeley, California. Um, Lindsay is a poet and translator working between English, Korean, and Swedish. They are the author of Transverse, a uh, future poem, 2021. Um, it's a gorgeous book. It's a really gorgeous book. So if you don't, already have that um don't don't sleep on it uh and a chapbook uh matrices from uh spec books in 2017 um they are a kundaman fellow and a phd student in english literature at uc berkeley um and with noah ross they are a founding co-editor of the chapbook press uh moon io um, and you can visit them at lindsaychoy.com um and i can i'll drop that link in the chat in a second um and now I'm going to pass it over to um, Sawako uh, for the next the next bio. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Zoe, for inviting me to co-host with you. It's been a pleasure and an honor for me as well. Um, always happy to be uh, doing an event with Belladonna and bringing voices into the space. So thanks to all our readers for joining us. Um, I'm going to share with you some information about our reader, Zara Patterson, who is a writer and educator. She's the author of Chronology from Ugly Duckling Press 2018 and a recipient of a Lambda Literary Award. Her performance essay, Policy, aired on Montez Press Radio and it was recorded in collaboration with sound designer, Melissa Pracht. Their next piece is forthcoming in Wasafiri Magazine. And back to you, Zoe. Uh, I feel like we're doing the weather. Like, <laughs> and next up to the east, we've got an Anna Moskovakis front moving in, uh, <laughs> a little low pressure. Uh, poet, novelist, translator, and occasional essayist. Um, she is the author of three uh, lovely books of poems. Most recently, they and we will get into trouble for this. Um, and the novel, Eleanor, or the Rejection of the Progress of Love, uh, as well as numerous chapbooks. Um, I would also pitch, I'm sorry, I'm like adding something to your bio. Could I also say philosopher? I feel like you're kind of a philosopher or I think of you as kind of a philosopher. No, no, don't, don't do that. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, back to the bio as written. Uh, her next book, Participation, is forthcoming in November from Coffee House Press. Um, she is also a translator, most recently of At Night, All Blood is Black, Frere de May by David Diop. Diop? Um, she has taught writing at Pratt, Bard, Columbia, Haystack, Naropa, and elsewhere, and is a member of the publishing collective Ugly Duckling Press, and a founding member of Bushel Collective, a mixed-use art and community space in the Western Catskills. Um, so please uh, give a warm e-welcome 
um, to our three readers. And over, I believe, to Lindsay first. Thank you so much. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Is this a decent volume? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks so much for this, um, for the invitation to read and um, for introducing me um, and for your kind words about Transverse. Um, I'm really excited uh, to be here and um, today I'm, I'm mostly gonna be trying out um, revisiting a second manuscript that I've been working on for a while, um, which feels good now that um, the first book is finally out and it <laughs> feels nice not reading, not reading from it. Um, and um, a lot of this book is um, a sort of translation commentary based on one poem, which is called uh, The Leper, Mundungi, by um, the modernist Korean poet So Jung Chu. Um, so with that said, we're going to start. 해와 하늘 빛이 문둥이는 서러워 보리밭에 달 뜨면 애기 하나 먹고 꽃처럼 붉은 울며 밤새 울었다. Sun, sky, light, leper, sorrow, barley field, moon, float, baby, one, he eats. Like flowers, scarlet cries all night, he cried. Sun, sky, light, moon, night, leper, baby, cries. Sun, sky, light, leper, moon, baby, night, cries. Sun, sky, light, leper, sorrow, moon, floats, baby, eats, night, cries, cries, flower-like, all night. Like flowers, cries, take the place of sleep. Sunrise, leper fills with flowers, leper fills with sleep. Dawn, leper is sorrow. When he moons over barley field, baby, one baby, he eats. Flowers, crimson, steal into the place of sleep. Dawn, sky, light, devours, sun, baby, flowers, Baby floats over barley field. Leper consumes, cries like sleep. Flowers cry the leper's sorrow. Sleep floats scarlet. A baby endures the moon. Hewa hanul bichu mundungin sorowo. Uribatse dal tumion egi hanamoko. Got churum bulgun ulmer pamse urata. Let this be called the soul room for it is where the soul leaves the body. In the periodical, the medical missionary, Dr. R. M. Wilson reports from Gwangju, Korea, in November, 1914. According to scripture, the leper was outcast, but in Christ's time, he was the first to touch the leper. It is a superstition among the lepers that one can never be cured of leprosy until one has eaten human flesh. A policeman told me that he had to arrest a leper for taking the life of a child. I have a window at my desk and every day, quite a number come begging for treatment and saying, give me life, give me life. I had to put a curtain at this window because the picture became so horrible. One man who came to our station hungry without food or raiment had suffered things impossible to describe. He was put into a little ward where the patients die. The lepers call this the soul room because it is where the soul leaves the body. The arrival of Christian missionaries to Korea marked the beginning of medical modernity. With the introduction of, the, of their semiotic systems, leprosy took on a new significance. Their mouths grew bloody with flesh. In the two years following Wilson's report, the Japanese colonial government, having occupied Korea since 1910, selected an island off the southeastern coast of the peninsula to convert into a national leprosium. Occupants were evicted from the island, after which 73 patients with leprosy were forcibly quarantined. By the 1940s, numbers had reached over 6,000. This leper colony was the site of forced sterilization, medical experimentation, torture, and enslavement, as lepers were forced to labor towards the Japanese war effort. 
Conditions of life in the leper colony appear as an intensification of colonial violence and disciplinary power exercised elsewhere on the mainland. And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. Matthew 11, 4 to 6. These categories of objection, we might suggest, come to represent the same basic metaphor, a carriage from the abject to the unclean, those who have no rights except to die, those whose only right is the right to die. This island is called Sorokdo. In Korean, Sorok means small deer, the island of small deer. Lepers were forcibly quarantined on Sorokdo until 1963. Only since 2007 has the island been accessible to outsiders. I want you to apologize. I want you to be accountable. I don't know what will suffice. In the end, I don't know what it would take for forgiveness. What conditions? I don't know if forgiveness is a concept adequate to the wrong. Some suggest the appeal of judgment is the presence of an objective moral determinant in the eradication of all past wrongs, as if this sense of justice were one in which time is set to naught, as if a sense of justice were placed in the fruit, in the fullness of time, confess to your wrongs. I want to hear you say, I want to hear you say that you are wrong. I am not sure if I want you to suffer. I want you to know, as if knowledge were adequate to, I want you to, I want. I want you. Imagine the worst thing you could do to someone. Now imagine the very worst. Investigation into the bones of ancient lepers reveals the presence of large amounts of mercury. This corresponds with the medical literature that reports the use of mercury as a treatment for leprosy. Some symptoms of leprosy include numbness, loss of sensation, loss of vision, paralysis. Symptoms of mercury poisoning include largely the same as well as cognitive confusion. Mercury would be applied directly to the skin and to open wounds seeping into the tender unfeeling flesh. Because so many of the symptoms overlap, it is conceivable that physicians may not have noticed that their patients were dying not of leprosy, but of heavy metal poisoning. My father recounts his childhood in Korea after the Korean War, the myth that lepers would kidnap children in, to eat in an attempt to be cured. 15th century King Sung Jong records an incident where a woman cut off her own finger, then dried and powdered it and fed it to her husband upon learning that human flesh was good for curing sickness. His leprosy was cured. This incident was read as an allegory of the wife's loyalty. With the spread of Christian missionaries in Korea, the use of human flesh as medicine mutated into the image of lepers as child eaters. Dispersed through the newly popularized printed public media, the discourse of infection and the hereditary nature of the disease started to emerge in propaganda supporting the sterilization and institutionalization of lepers after the 1930s. Dodie Bellamy writes, when the sick rule the world, the limbs of the well will be chopped off in the middle of the night, the well one still alive, flailing and screaming. The limbs of the well will fetch exorbitant fees in the black market, sold to sorcerers who will dry the limbs and grind them into magic powders to be placed into amulets to ward off blindness and toxins. These amulets will bring prosperity to their owners. When the sick rule the world, the powdered limbs of the well will settle into the market. They can indeed be sold, but only as parable. Imagine the dealer's murmur. Paradise is here already among us. According to Plutarch, the Greek philosopher Anaxagoras lends to the sun's rays a subtle whistling that makes voices more discomforting to hear during the day than at night. Likewise, when it is said that light is a sound too high pitch for the human ear to hear, but that one day it will become accessible to another ear, awakened in another life, and that indeed, we will be able to hear the music of the spheres like the moment of love that, in Dante's words, moves the sun and the other stars. We must fully comprehend that sound has become a metaphor. Sun, sky, leper fills with 
light. Scarlet flowers fill his mouth. Sun, sky, flowers, eat night. Leper floats, moonlike. An infant grows scarlet with sleep. All night, the moon cracks and something slips out. Leper floats over a field of eggs. Like cries, they flower in place of light. Um, and then I'm going to read from another section of this manuscript, um, which is kind of, which is fairly new. It's called Who Can Remember His Past Lives? And um, it's loosely based on uh, the Pichapong Rias, the Cole movie, Uncle Boon Me, Who Can Recall His Past Lives? Um, so yes, um, who can remember his past lives for Nate? Enter the scene of the blue ball bellowing, the pillar of smoke. Scales grow over your eyes. Your limbs grow heavy with mercury. She appears to you to be of semi-synthetic substance. Your kidneys fill with fluid. You appear to you to be of semi-synthetic substance. Your manufacturer imparts the concept of your hand. It tips off the circuit. Your manufacturer appears to you to be of your own design. Scales grow between you and your measures. Your manufacturer is semi-translucent and full of fluid. She is held aloft in mercury. You appear to manifest another. Fish move among your jewels. You appear to manifest an other and its apprehension. Memory operates as if within you. Your manufacturer appears to you to be of your own self same substance. Memory operates as if upon or becomes you. Your hands held aloft in mercury. Your concepts move among your jewels. You have exchanged much of your blood for lymph. Enter the pale bowl, bright smoke. Your hands held aloft in their self same substance. Fish dart amidst your thighs. As though you could establish equivalence without measure or price. She is held aloft as if enscaled. Your hands fill with fluid, as if by love possessed. Your skin is dry and of itself same substance. When we investigate further, we find that all appears upside down. Fish move among your circuits. You emerge amidst your articulations. Scales operate as if within you. You have made yourself beautiful in vain. Your jewels appear to move. Your body is dry and appears to emit a low hum, as if by love possessed. You once appear to be emitting a low light. Your skin has pebbled over like fruit. Your lips move as if within you. When caressed, your scales express a clear fluid. You are muddy and swollen with cold. Your manufacturer appears to you to be your own hand. You emerge garbed in your exchanges. Your manufacturer appears to you to operate as a semi-synthetic substance. In your book, all my parts have been written. You appear to move amongst the exterior of a vent. You hold the child aloft, as if of greater mass held aloft in smoke. It appears to emit a lunar hum. You appear to be an agent of synchrony. Its skin smells powdery and lactic. Your lips move as if among fish, as if of greater musculature aloft in smoke. Your color manufactures intercourse with the exterior of a vent. You appear to exchange position with your self-same substance, as with fish which become light. Your eyes flicker as if within you. She appears as either frequency or motion. Your bones are permeated with phosphorus, for he gives to his beloveds sleep. You moved your hands as if tuning, thus you have appeared to emit a low light. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I'm going to share my screen with everybody. Okay, can't see anybody. Let's get some people in my view so I'm not completely alone. Um, thank you. Belladonna and uh, Suwako and Zoe for inviting me. And um, thank you again, Lindsay, for your reading. Um, and thank you, Anna. I'm excited to read with you. 
I'll be starting with a little bit from Chronology, my book that came out in 2018, and it was published um, by Ugly Duckling Press, and in many ways, Anna is the midwife um, to Chronology. She brought it safely into the world, so I'm really thrilled to be reading it here with her, and um, I'm just going to jump right in. I'm not going to give any context or background information, and, and can everybody hear me fine? Okay. Attempt two, you came weeping. I am looking and hoping up to now those like Dawn are grieved. I am at a loss, medicinal stranger. The I am a fighter, they bow Cheng without reason. I splintered full of arrogance. Hello, ha ho, po ho, peli. Bull runs without reason. Yes, your hair, yes, something. Yes, we do drill. We have changed to silence. My surprise is our action to do good in the face of evil. Attempt one. You will come weeping, Mitsotsu Nguanake. I look, you hurry, hoping I am black. Up to now, the same. Om, like dawn, becomes painful, is grieved. I no bueno. The stranger is the healer, those that I am. Ketsu battle axe their bow cheng. A.S.A., however, not once, you sheep. I splinter, I am full, I am pride. Que dumela hore ha ho po ho peli. Bull, I am na without reason. Que ne ke holi soa, que ina. A means yes, na is with. Up to now, I have hair. E ka matsuhong. Que sa floke, something. But yes, we intend ha ke kena to drill at sanang, changing silence, my surprise. Ba bangata baneng when etla baneng. How long is it going to last? We continue to bring evil. Twenty fourth of December, two thousand nine, Thursday. Yesterday was chapter two and we ended up in each other's arms, dancing, climbing narrow stairs with three glasses of water, dominoes with no introductions, a bed in another room, a bottle of the wandering grape, artsy atmosphere, young people, old barman, the coolest cat there, quality tunes, low lighting, remembering red walls, back home with chips, dancing, smoking across the threshold, turning, jazzing and jiving, then I gave her water and said, good night. I'd been in Cape Town for a little over a week when we met. She entered to use the waiter's mobile, then asked to put her bags at my table for safekeeping while she ran down the block to buy him minutes. She didn't know him. She didn't know me. She commanded the space with her tiny presence. Upon her return, she noticed a book on my table and demanded to know why I was, who indeed I was to be reading Dambuzo Marichera. She then gave me a list of her favorite titles on a piece of note paper, along with her email address. Our first encounter was brief, but I emailed her the next day or so, and we became roommates. March 31st, 2015. She's dead, I said out loud. I hadn't meant to say it that way, cold and abrupt, untrue. I'm gonna close with um, the last page of chronology. Uh, it's an email from me to Diapolo, from Zara Patterson to Diapolo Rantequa. June 19th, 2010, no subject. One day we'll go walking in the Soto. We'll be in our forties and generally okay with our lives. And we'll laugh about how screwed up our mid to late twenties fucking were. Today, I'm doing really well. Everything's daily in my life, the ups and downs. I hope you're looking forward to your sister's wedding. It will be beautiful, surely. I'm going to Detroit on Monday just for a week. 
it'll be nice to take a vacation. And there's a big forum going on there. We can change the world and make it better. Lots of love. Okay, so stop sharing there. And actually, I think I'll read on this instead of my screen. Hope that works. Um, I'm reading from a very new work. It's called Jill. And I think it's a novel. It's very new. It's brand new. So I don't want to, um, I don't know, it might not be. Okay. And I'll, read, I'll start with the preface. And it's a letter found in a 2005 journal. And this is fiction. So I'm not going to say whether or not this letter is um, a real letter or not, um, in a real journal or not. So, dear Jill, the California bar, this is a quote. The California bar was a long narrow room with greenish lighting that made the customers look like cadavers, close quote. I'm reading Two Crimes by Jorge Ibar Gogensia. The back and front covers of this translated novel are falling to pieces. Every time I touch it, a new piece flakes off. The bottom of my bag is full of thick bits of plasticky paper. I'm becoming deeply involved in a book I'm not writing. Everything I see, smell, and touch ignites an inarticulable image. I'm trying to interpret it. I'm only able to transcribe ideas. I can't capture the image. My goal is to pursue the inarticulable image through a sequence of fragments that form a novel. I'll play with perspective and concepts of self, but where are the characters? It's all philosophy, and I don't know anything about philosophy. I was talking to a friend the other day, trying to explain where I wanted it all to go, and she told me my ideas were very Eastern, Taoist, I think. And I know nothing about that, which has sent me on another tangent, and I am still without a character. I know she is young, both the protagonist and the antagonist, and almost definitely me. Maybe that's what makes it so hard. How can one write a character who is impossible to know? Because I don't know who I am, and that's what the book is about. I've been delayed at an airport, better than a plane crash, and I found myself in the mirror of a bar. I don't sign the letter. One. I exit and retrace my steps, shedding the tension from a meeting that concluded with a forced smile and bared teeth. I relax my shoulders, fall into an easy stride and decide to walk the mile and a half to the coffee shop. The sky is HD blue and white. I am the protagonist in an American Indian indie film that is ending. I haven't won, but I have my dignity. I inhale the dry 60 degree air along with the scent of warm sugar wafting from the Polish bakery. An illegible sound catches my attention and I forget the producer from whose studio I just bolted while speaking in euphemisms. Ahead in my inevitable path, humans are distributing information written and spoken. Their noise wafts less pleasantly than the freshly baked bread. I consider crossing, but traffic is flowing in both directions, and I'm eager to get to the cafe where I'll write a new query to a producer with a sense of aesthetics. Take back your narrative, a freckled youngster with wrinkled hands thrusts a dark pink flyer at me. I nod and slip it in my pocket without making eye contact or shifting my gait. Tell your story, another shouts from behind a table stacked with zines. I decide to ignore. I pause at the crosswalk and one approaches me surreptitiously, blocks my way. Own your narrative, she articulates with urgency. I mutter that I received the flyer, thank you, as I maneuver around, but not before I notice the yellow eyes. I cringe with guilt as I half skip across the street to avoid engaging with the young QTPOC writers. I have a flyer. I'll order a few zines when I get home. I promise the ancestors. Two, 
This is uh, email style from Ananvo to Ion Celebrator. Subject, the tension of eternity. V, I went for a swim today. There's a lake north of the city that is scarcely populated this time of year. The water was cold. I made an avocado and egg sandwich for breakfast with arugula, lots of arugula. Then I stretched out to read from works of love. I appreciated the turn of phrase, the tension of eternity, and wanted to share it with you. In this section, Kay is unpacking the second commandment, thou shalt love thy neighbor. He argues that embedded in the language is an implication of self-love as a precedent to loving the other. I also love this line. Earthly love is still not the eternal love. It is the beautiful fantasy of the infinite. Its highest expression is mysterious foolishness. I'm off for a walk, might pop into a bookshop. Thanks for the Lydia Davis rec. Jill. Three. I encountered Jill on Craigslist. She lives elsewhere, but posts in the woman for woman section of my city. The post consists of the lyrics of space dementia. I respond with endlessly, and those are both um, muse songs. And we become pen pals. She is a writer with a nine to five. I don't ask her about the woman in my city who is the intended recipient of, I love all the dirty tricks and twisted games you play. She doesn't share. We speak minimally about our lives. We exchange language. This is years ago, during the brief era that follows dinosaur newspaper personals and precedes the dating app scene. We lose touch after corresponding for a few months, each subject line a resonant excerpt. Who then is one's neighbor? Kierkegaard persists. I see why Joe likes him. The self-aware quality of his prose touches the absurd. This is a quote. It might seem that a mere protestation to this effect on the part of the author himself would be more than enough, for surely he knows best what is meant. For my part, however, I have little confidence in protestations with respect to literary production, and I'm inclined to take an objective view of my own words. If a third person in the role of a reader, if as a third person in the role of a reader, I cannot substantiate the fact that what I affirm is so, and it could not but to be so, it would not occur to me to wish to win a cause I, which I regard as lost. I think of myself as a reader often, the writer, the protagonist, the reader, it's not an unfamiliar exercise of the imagination. I don't know if you can hear my cat, but he's making a lot of noise. Sorry about that. Um, but surely the writer cannot pretend to be an objective reader. It is a thing of blindness to imagine seeing oneself without all the layers of history with self, albeit a commendable exercise. Sometimes I see flaws in my writing and thinking, of course, but I see those flaws as I, not as other. In order to see one's neighbor, the other, one must recognize the reflection and the difference that is lovable. The great challenge is for true sight to embody love. Jill and I don't speak about love in the abstract. We do, however, correspond for months without revealing our last names. I don't think of the encounter as erotic, strangely. I don't think of her as my neighbor or of the potential of loving her as myself. I don't think of self-love during this period. I'm more interested in Camus and alienation from myself, the disembodied in a body. I spend hours staring down from tree branches on window ledges, watching myself go through the motions, not close enough to feel, just enough to survive life a sentence fragment, I tangent to a world where nouns replace verbs, I happiness to survive. Four. It is 2025. The collapse of the dating app scene is impending, and tonight I have dinner plans with Jill. We have not kept in touch with since the aughts, but she has appeared sporadically in dating apps, sometimes as herself, 
sometimes as someone else. What I'm trying to explain will clarify itself in the storytelling process. It is inexplicable and apparent. Trust me. Thank you. Hello, I'm trying to type and uh, <laughs> and press unmute at the same time. That was so great. I didn't manage to type. Um, hi, it's so great, amazing to be here. I just wanted to say, um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, um, that, uh, yeah, I'm sort of in a phase where I'm not feeling particularly inclined to do readings, but I think it might've taken about 30 seconds to respond that I was, going to be delighted to join <laughs> this one just because um all I mean all four of you um just this the group of names in the email was like lights in my life and I'm just so so pleased to be here with with you all and I'm also just a little frazzled about reading in a time when I don't so much know what that means um so appreciating also the the invitation to share work in progress which is what this is um I'm going to read from a poem called, it's a provisionally called Preliminary Notes on Risk. Um, there are a lot of disclaimers in the title and I don't think I need to say anything more about it except that it's unfinished. Preliminary Notes on Risk. I keep saying I want to write about what really matters, but what if that can only mean what really matters to me? That's the first problem. I've often said about writers that their writing keeps me company, that all I want is to keep others company too, any one other, any one. I have questions, what matters and what matters to me and to others, and also how does one know? When I translate, I am translating what I don't know. When I write, when I write and the writing feels alive, it is because I am writing what I know but don't yet know I know. I am writing what my writing knows but hasn't yet told me. What matters to me now at the time of this writing is to find a way to write through a paralyzing fear. This is personal. So personal, it's hard to imagine that the writing that results could keep anyone company at all any one other even, any one. I am writing these lines from a low, low place, wanting to die or to crawl under the bed forever, wanting to hide, which is not the same as wanting to die, which makes me want to know why the sentences arrive in that order. I want to die, I want to crawl under the bed forever, in that order. The second, a revision of the first, a backtrack. And recognizing this, only makes it happen again, it makes me want to crawl deeper into the hole, farther under the bed, to disappear, which is also different from dying. Disappear from whom? From others? From every other one? I am loved. I am fortunate, even when the hole calls, even when the space below the bed calls, there is some smallest voice, some smallest flash. A flash that is not understanding, but that takes understanding's place. A phrase I wrote the other day in the context of a fiction about a person who is barely hanging on, a person who tries to write her way out. The flash that is not understanding, but that takes understanding's place says, you are loved, you are fortunate, you are loved and you love. And yet I'm afraid all the time of what? Of everything, every. Thing. And then sometimes nothing. There is very little in between. When I'm afraid of nothing, it's not because I feel invincible. When I'm afraid of nothing, it's because I'm in a state of believing in the connection between people, because I am feeling the connection between people momentarily, the connection between myself and another person or people or sometimes by proxy. Sometimes I am sensing or feeling the connection between other people and I'm believing it momentarily. And in the moment in which I'm observing and believing it, I am not afraid. 
Connections between people are not safe. They are risky. So why does experiencing the risky connection between myself and an other, or observing the risky connection between an other and another other make me feel safe? What is this feeling of safety? What does safety mean? Safety is probably the wrong word. One of the reasons it's so hard to write about what really matters is that it's so easy to use the wrong word. It is always only possible to use the wrong word. We know that there is no right word, but we still hold ourselves accountable. We both believe and don't believe that there is a right word and a wrong word. Who is this we? We is probably the wrong word too. Safety in the sense of security is not what I mean. Safety in the sense of security is not something I seek. Things that are secure are only secure temporarily. Security as a concept exists only because insecurity as a concept reigns, because property as a concept reigns. Safety in the sense of out of danger is also not what I mean. I covered this before. First of all, this is impossible, but also risk is inherent in connections between people. Risk is nothing if not being in danger. What I'm trying to get at is that there is something that feels safe, though that's not exactly the right word. There is something that feels safe about certain situations that are only possible because they're not safe. There's the feeling again, the one about dying, which gets replaced by the one about crawling into a hole or hiding under the bed forever. The feeling arises when I recall that even if I'm trying hard to write about what matters, especially when I'm trying the hardest to write about what matters and to do so in a way that might just possibly keep some other company, any other, just one, that in these moments of trying to write about what really matters to me and possibly to some other as well, I am not covering new ground. It almost makes me laugh to type out the sentence that came to mind just now. The sentence is, of course, I am not the first to think these thoughts, nor am I the first to write them down. It almost makes me laugh to think that such a sentence would come to mind when it is not only so obvious as to be unnecessary to articulate, it is also the kind of obvious acknowledgement that feels disingenuous or that risks being seen as disingenuous since it contains in itself the possibility of its opposite. It would not be necessary to articulate the negation in the idea, I am not the first to think X, Y, or Z, if there weren't some underlying belief that it might possibly be possible that despite the protestations, the I and the sentence, parentheses, I cannot accept that that I is me, since I only thought about writing the sentence but didn't until I decided to write about the sentence and its problems, which is not the same as simply writing the sentence directly as if I trusted it to say what matters close parentheses. If there weren't some underlying belief that it might possibly be possible that despite the protestations, the I and the sentence believes themselves capable of being the first to think X, Y, or Z. Now another sentence comes to mind regarding this hesitation to accept that the I is me, the sentence, the lady doth protest too much which is a sentence I have known as if always, a sentence I don't remember learning that I don't recall being taught. A sentence among the many sentences that were fed to me somehow and got tagged in my brain as worth remembering. But for whatever reason, the origin of the sentence did not get tagged the same way. So I don't know the origin of the sentence. I don't know the origin of the sentence as it was first presented to me, nor do I know the origin of the sentence as it was presented to the person or text that first presented it to me, nor do I know the origin of that presentation or all the way back to the person who may have in the first place made the sentence. For the first time, I mean, if a person can make a sentence for the first time. I don't even know if the sentence as it was presented to me was a sentence I was receiving, as they say in translation. I know that I could find out the history of the sentence, the lady doth protest too much. That I could find out very easily what the agreed upon origin of the sentence is according to the people who believe the sentence matters. But I am beginning to suspect that there's a problem with this ease of finding out agreed upon origins, agreed upon meanings. The oversimplicity and ubiquity of this idea, of this suspicion that there is a problem with the ease of finding out origins and meanings makes me want to crawl farther under the bed. But 
Now that I am on a train of thinking, even if it's a bad train, a train that is on the wrong track, a train on a track to nowhere. Now that I am on a train, any train, it is a little bit easier not to want to die. It is a little bit easier not to want to preemptively die while on the moving train. Thinking about this almost makes me laugh. Does being on the moving train create a feeling of safety or safety? Even if the train might crash? I once wrote about the feeling of relief that comes from giving over my life to a stranger, to a pilot or a surgeon, even if I don't know whether the pilot is competent or whether the surgeon has my best interests at heart. This feels dangerous to write because I don't want to suggest that this feeling is universal or defensible. I don't want to suggest that I have company in this feeling. I am afraid that having such feelings is bad, that having such feelings is a luxury, that being a person who has feelings that are a luxury is bad. The space under the bed calls, the hole calls, death calls. So many other writers have written about the ways in which death calls and about the connections to be made between the ways death calls and the ways in which life also calls. How can the thing that matters most to say be something that also has mattered most for so many others to say? But also how can this not be the case? In the metaphor of tagging that I used above, in the metaphor in which things that enter our brains get tagged as worth remembering or worth forgetting or worth remembering but not consciously, a label which could be translated as worth repressing, my tagging system is all fucked up. My tagging system seems to be calibrated in exactly the wrong way so that the things that matter most, the things I wish I could remember are tagged either worth forgetting or worth repressing, while the things that are useless or worse than useless, the things that are toxic even to me and to others are tagged worth remembering. Because my tagging system is fucked up, I am constantly ashamed. I am ashamed of what I remember and of what I don't, of what I forget and of what I don't. And if I were aware of all the things I repress, I'm sure I would be ashamed of them too. When I look at the tag cloud that represents my mind, I cannot see a picture of myself that I can live with. The picture I see is one I am afraid of. It's a picture of a version of myself that forgets love and remembers fear. A version that forgets the things I have read and seen and heard, the things that have kept me company over the years. A version that forgets company matters. The company is among what has mattered most over the years. A version that remembers only the fact that I forget and I'm ashamed of forgetting and only the things that I don't know I repress but I'm ashamed of nonetheless. It makes me laugh. I see a picture of this version of me. Version is probably the wrong word. This version of me that makes me say the sentence, I want to die and then revise it to, I want to crawl in a hole or I want to hide under the bed. I mean, in the metaphor in which my mind is a tag cloud, what matters is not what really matters. In the picture of this version of me that is unrecognizable to myself, I don't care what happens to myself. I don't keep company with myself. I disattach from myself, let the pilot take over, the surgeon. I say to myself, whoever, I'm some, I must, or any, two. I am trying to practice not dying while living, a concept I owe to Anne Dufourmentel, whose book In Praise of Risk I'm reading in translation, and I'm trying to tag worth remembering. I am practiced in dying while living, it seems. It began when I was young, and the practice has continued beneath other practices that occasionally reach me, other instructions that should be tagged worth remembering, but which I seem destined to forget. The number of practices sold to people as ways of preventing a particular suffering, a particular suffering that it seems might be described by the phrase dying while living, but that also can be described by anxiety, despair, depression, shame, and other terms often prefaced by the modifiers acute or debilitating. The number of these practices sold or given out for free, a giving out for free that does not come, it seems, without a cost. These practices, many in number and high in costs, seem to share at least one common denominator, a 
common denominator so fixed, it seems, so fixed that trying to budge it is like trying to budge a thing everyone knows, but nobody really understands, a thing like gravity and how it works, or why it is that a brain is a physical thing made up of analyzable physical things, which have been proven to be above all alterable by any large number of practices, any large number of disparate practices, like cutting with a knife, like eating drugs from pharmaceutical plants or drugs from dirt grown plants, practices like talking, fucking, walking and sitting, like surfing before dawn, like painting, like learning a new skill, like going to a place you've never been, like playing a game, like winning or losing at a game, like offering to help and like being helped, like swiping left and right and up and down, like tapping and swiping and clicking, like biting and tying and pricking and holding. Practices upon practices, each of them capable of altering this physical brain type thing in ways that everybody knows the way everybody knows that you are what you eat and that that is both true and not true enough, just as the physicalness of the brain is true and not true enough. But I was talking specifically about the practices sold to people or given out for free, but not without cost, as practices made to combat the kinds of suffering often prefaced by the words acute or debilitating. And I am wondering now if these practices, which are suspect, which everybody knows are suspect, are nonetheless popular, are nonetheless adopted, in part because they offer a way, they offer a path toward not dying while living, and whether the path they offer, which has a common denominator I forgot to name, a common denominator that is hard to name fully and accurately, but that seems to turn on, that seems to turn around the concept of the self-contained individual self. I am wondering if these practices, which are suspect and costly, whether immediately or whether down the line, are nonetheless appealing because they treat a real problem, a problem everybody knows is real, a problem named in Stephen Miller's translation of Anne Dufourmantel's book on risk dying while living. Three, I have been thinking about messages and how they're transmitted, about how messages are transmitted and by whom and to whom, and about how those messages are received how there is no one way or two or three ways, how there is no small number of ways in which this happens and how obvious this is when you try to lay it out and how easy it is to forget. Earlier, I wrote lady as if referring to myself, but my gender has always been, I'm glad I'm not a man. Like my poetics has always been, at least I'm not hurting anyone which is not only a lie, but is just another way of pretending I don't exist. What would it be like to be okay with existing, to be okay in the not okay of doing existence? A poem, Simone says, has the shape of a wave. My question has always been, why was I made wrong? Some things are maybe worth repressing to make space for the things that are worth remembering. I'm not finished yet. I don't want to feel good. I want to be shaped like company, which is also shaped like a wave, which is shaped like a problem, which has the shape of a poem. Thank you for listening. <laughs> That was amazing. That was so wonderful. Thank you, everyone.